may have to ask you to hold on to that thought, okay. unfortunately. We have a conference that has just started. We understand that there's a commission that is reporting to the plenary, particularly about organization renewal. Let's uh, cut across life to the proceedings. At the national conference. And therefore, a narrative in reflecting the outcome of the policy conference that uh, seeks to portray victors and vanquished would not be accurate because discussions continue. I will also assume that you are familiar with uh, the long document of about 50 pages on strategy and tactics of the ANC, which seeks to outline the kind of society that we seek to create, and secondly, what methods, what programs we need to adopt in order to achieve that objective. All the 11 commissions for the first day of a discussion in the commissions discussed the strategy and tactics document and the sense that all the rapporteurs and chairs had is that the discussions were incisive, they focused on the substantive issues, and everyone was quite impressed with the quality and the focus of the delegates on those strategic issues. The next matter would be the major conceptual issues that were under discussion. You will be aware that the title of uh, this document is Enhancing Organizational Integrity in Order to Intensify Action Towards a National Democratic Society. This is the first time that the ANC in its strategy and tactics document refers to the issue of organizational integrity. Because the assessment is that so fraught has the environment within the organization become that if the ANC does not experience a turnaround, it will not be able to construct that national democratic society that it aspires to. The issue was raised, is it to restore or to enhance organizational integrity? And ultimately the conclusion that was reached was that we are not looking back to some glorious past, but what we need to do under changed and changing circumstances is to ensure that the ANC develops, enhances its organizational integrity in order to be able to play its historic role. With regard to the strategic goals of the ANC, there was the issue that was raised about how in simple terms can we characterize this national democratic society? And the agreement as reflected in the draft is that the closest that that society can be equated to across the globe would be a combination of a developmental state that leads in ensuring very high rates of growth, but secondly, combined with social democracy, a state that ensures redistribution of resources in favor of the poor. So it is a combination of what you would find, for instance, in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, South Korea, Singapore, and so on. Social democracy, you can look at some European states, especially the Nordic countries. But there was the emphasis that historically some of the developmental states were not democratic. If you look at South Korea, for instance, at the beginning, and that therefore it is important that we emphasize in the South African setting that this, this developmental state should be a democratic developmental state. There was then an intense discussion on the issue of monopoly capital. And the outcome of that discussion is as follows. Firstly, it reiterates 
what is contained in the 2007 strategy and tactics document. And this is that the relationship between the ANC and monopoly capital in particular, but also capital in general, is one of unity and struggle, or if you like, cooperation and contestation. There are areas where we would seek to cooperate with them. Higher rates of investment, job creation, skilling of people, matters to do with uh, broad-based black economic empowerment and so on. But there is also the challenge of monopoly companies conducting themselves in such a way that they undermine societal interests. Collusion, high prices in the product markets, high returns that would not reflect the correct or appropriate distribution of uh, income between the managers and the workers and so on and so forth. So the relationship is one of cooperation and contestation. The issue was then raised. Do we want to characterize monopoly capital as it manifests itself in South Africa as white monopoly capital? And nine out of those 11 commissions said the phenomenon of monopoly capital is a global one and it manifests itself differently in various parts of the globe. And in that context, it would therefore not be correct to characterize ours simply as white monopoly capital. That relationship that we were describing would apply whether that capital is Japanese, it's Indian, it's white, or whatever other category you can think about. But it was also felt that we need to elaborate in that context that in the South African situation, we cannot run away from the reality of white dominance in the economy in the context of assets, of income, of the professions, as well as other privileges that we have inherited from the past. Why I was saying it is important to understand the character of the policy conference? It is that even if there was that view from the majority of the commissions, the view of the other two commissions, the views are also reflected in the report. With them believing that the characterization should be white monopoly capital because of their own analysis of its manifestation in the South African conditions. And it is agreed that that discussion will continue in the branches for resolution at the national conference. There is also agreement that um, at the instance of the achievement of democracy, the balance of forces started shifting more and more in favor of the forces of change. But in the current period, as I was saying, we are in that kind of fraught environment. As a result of objective conditions, the state of the economy, the global economy as well, but also as a consequence of subjective factors, weaknesses within the ANC and its allies, that the balance of forces is not much in favor of the forces of change. And therefore the decisions that are taken as recommendations at this conference and in December will be fundamental to ensuring that the ANC enhances its organizational integrity and is able to speed up the process of change. If that does not happen, then there will be major and terrible consequences for the ANC. Everyone accepts that. You, if you have read the document, you might know that two concepts are posited. Can we characterize South Africa today as neo-colonialism of a special type or racial capitalism. 
After a long discussion, it was agreed that neither of the two are accurate as a characterization of the South African political economy today. Racial capitalism, because it has got its own history and usages internationally today that would muddy the waters. Neo-colonialism of a special type because what the commissions argued is whilst there might be some elements of neo-colonialism, you achieve freedom but you have not as yet attained economic liberation. It's not a static situation. But if we do not move fast enough to change economic relations, we might end up in that state of neo-colonialism of a special type. There was also debate on social agency what the ANC would call the motive forces, and there is agreement with what is contained in the document. With some emphasis here, the central role that rural women, for instance, play. Secondly, also, that there is a new phenomenon that cannot be ignored. Because of high rates of unemployment and economic marginalization, especially amongst the youth, you have a subsector emerging in society which can be susceptible to mobilization by both or either extreme left wing or extreme right wing forces. And that, that is an issue around which we should exercise vigilance. I should say that those are amongst the major issues uh, and maybe when questions arise, we will respond to those questions because I do not want to bore you with a very high level debates that take place in the ANC. To give you an example, does the ANC have an ideology? And how do you define ideology? And ultimately, it was agreed, it's a system of ideas that inform political and economic policy, and in that narrow sense, or rather in that broad sense, therefore the ANC has an ideology. But we'll take questions. Thanks very much, colleague. Thank you very much, good evening. Um, the, the second Part of what the, um, of the briefing focus on the discussions that we had for one day on organizational renewal and looking at organizational design. And as Comrade Joel said, that the major focus of the strategy and tactic documents is to look at how do we address and restore the integrity of the ANC as a movement for change and a movement that organize and lead people in the process of, of creating a better life for all. The organizational renewal therefore focus on a number of issues. One of them is the question about the, uh, the character of the ANC and what organizational capacities we need to build. The second issue looked at how do we ensure and restore organizational integrity. And then the third set of issues focus on the elections, because of course we're going to have elections in, in a couple of months' time for the National Executive Committee. Um, and therefore, how do we approach this in a way that address the challenge of factionalism as well as the challenge of slates that we spoke about? The starting point of the discussions on organizational renewal focus on the character of the ANC. And the ANC since 1994, has identified its character in two folds. Firstly, that it remains a, a national liberation movement that has to continue to organize and mobilize people in support of their own development and in support of addressing um, and the creation of a better life in all sectors and across um, society. This means that the ANC pays specific attention to how it builds branches, how it engages um, with its youth and women's league, how it engages with the trade union movement as well as civil society um, and society broadly. The second part of, of the character of the ANC is that as a registered political party, we also contest elections and therefore the ANC has to have the capacities and capabilities to govern 
um, to, to be able to implement its policies and translate it into government policies, as well as monitoring the impact of those policies. In addition to that, and I think it was probably an issue that we have not addressed and we were a bit in, in denial about it since we've been in opposition since 1994 in KwaZulu-Natal at a later stage in, in Western Cape and now in a number of areas that in addition to preparing and developing strategies for, as a governing party, we also need to develop strategies as an opposition as well as strategies in terms of coalition, so that it's not something that we do on the basis of, of, of as it happened, but that you have a general orientation in a multi-party system that this is what happened. And in fact, over the last 23 years, that is exactly what has, what has, what has happened. Um, on the organizational capabilities, the focus was on branches and what we need to do to revitalize branches, the work in the communities that they play, the link with ward councillors, the issues about taking up community issues, responding to the concerns that communities raise around service delivery um, and the kind of relationship between councils and, and local communities, but also national departments and provincial departments and local communities as well as the work that, that the ANC has, branches has to do around issues of education, so participation in the school governing bodies, in the community policing forums, um, and in general community activities. So, so there's a whole range of lists of issues that's been proposed with regards to branches. There are also specific proposals that we're making and new recommendations on the role that provincial executive committees and uh, regional executive committees and the NEC needs to play in supporting this mass work of the ANC and particularly supporting the outward orientation of branches and ANC structures across the board. The um, organizational capac capacities also looked at the role of the, of the Women's League. Um, that the Women's League we define as part and women as part of the motor forces because in the building of the non-sexist society and the dismantling of patriarchal relations, of course women have the most to gain from that process and therefore the win Women's League has to play an important role as part of a broader women's movement in the country. Similarly on the Youth League, we looked at the strengthening of the, of the Youth League. South Africa, like the rest of Africa, has a youth bulge. Um, and therefore, specific attention needs to be, be, be placed in strengthening the Youth League, but also more specifically in ensuring that government and society in general pays sufficient attention to the development of young people, whether it is the skills revolution, whether it is in employment creation, whether it's in entrepreneurship. It's all part of those issues that we, that we need to look at. There was a specific, a couple of specific proposals that will go back to branches for debate. The first one is which the Youth League has proposed and commissions considered for a 40% quota for young people across structures within the ANC. And that uh, uh, will go back to structures for, for, for consideration before national conference. The other one relates to um, the relationship between the Youth League and the student movement, in particular SASCO and how uh, we work together in terms of ensuring a progressive position on campus and contesting how do we um, ensure that we don't contest elections against each other, but if the student movement contests elections, that the Youth League will then um, support that process. The Commission on Organizational Re Renewal, when looking at organizational capacities, also talked about the state of the trade union movement and reaffirmed the commitment of the ANC and the broader alliance towards one, uni one industry, one union, one, federation, one country, one federation. That the fragmentation that's happening in the union movement is not good for the working class, it's not good for workers, um, and therefore we need to ensure that we work with COSATU, that we work with all union movements, whether they're within COSATU or outside, towards the unity of, 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 of the working class movement and towards um, um, looking at how do we build uh, unity across the, different, the differences. The, the um, final issue, I suppose, on, on organizational renewal and capacities relate to building the policy capacity of the ANC, and there was a very strong view that 
The ANC needs to strengthen its capacity to monitor the impact of its policies, firstly, whether it implements its policies, and secondly, what the impact of those policies are. And when I come to the suggestions around the National Executive Committee, we will talk about what the specific proposals are. But it also looked at how the ANC engaged with civil society, the new emerging left movements, civil society movements, issue-based organizations, and how the ANC continued to engage and, and reach out to these uh, uh, structures. The second set of issues focus on organizational integrity, which was addressed within the strategy and tactics document and, and being one of the major tasks that the policy conference and the national conference in December needs to address. And it focused on how do we um, address the question about the social distance between the leadership of the, of the ANC and government and uh, ANC members and broader society um, and the support base of the a ANC. How do we address the issue of corruption? And how do we address the question about discipline within the organization? And there are fairly comprehensive suggestions and recommendations that will go to branches on looking at issues of social distance and, and addressing social distance, how do we address the questions um, around corruption and very uh, uh, um, firm suggestions about how the ANC must deal with corruptions, that if there are allegations of corruptions that the provincial, national secretaries and regional secretaries have the responsibility, if action is not taken, that they will be held accountable for the lack of actions and they will have to explain why actions have not been taken, that the ANC needs to distance itself from corruption, whether it's in its ranks, individuals, whether it's outside of its ranks, whether it is its supporters or donors or people that they have relationships with, that we need to be very firm uh, uh, about that. Overall, the, 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 the process, the instrument that we see to enforce this process and the recommendations that we're making around combating corruption and restoring the, the integrity of the, of the ANC is the strengthening of the integrity committee that was adopted in the last conference. Now, the, the proposals that's going to branches is that the integrity committee must become an independent structure with constitutional powers within the ANC to be able to summons anybody to account that they will have, that they will, that they must have the powers to take decisions and that they will then report the decisions on any matter to uh, the structure of the, of the organization. And that's the proposals that's going to, proposal that's going to branches um, for discussion. And then of course, uh, the strengthening of the disciplinary procedures within the organization. The final set of issues focus on the elections of leadership towards national conference. And the problem that we, that we are trying to address with a set of recommendations that's going back to branches is how do we ensure that, you're, that in the election of the National Executive Committee and of course cascading down to, to provinces and, and regions and branches, do we address the problem of factionalism that has become endemic um, and a cancer within the ANC as well as slates? Um, and the following recommendations were made. The first one was, was with regards to the size of the NEC. There seemed to be a general view, but will be confirmed by the structures of the ANC in the discussion of the, the policy conference, that we need to reduce the size of the NEC, that you need a much more smaller, working, workable NEC that are able to discuss issues, that are able to process issues, but also ensure that you do have the best in the ANC making up and consisting of that, 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 that NEC. So that's the first proposal. Um, and the size matter from anything between 40 and 60 people. At the moment, we have an NEC of about, about 80 directly uh, elected members. So that's the first proposal. The second proposal is that we should look at the size of the officials. At the moment, we have a top, what we call the top six. It is the president, the, the deputy president, the national chairperson, the secretary general, the deputy secretary, and um, the Treasury. treasurer general. The proposal is, and there are two options that we will take to branches and the leagues and structures. The first one is that instead of having, um, that we should have two deputy presidents with specific responsibilities, one looking at international relations, the other one looking at monitoring of business of governance and the implementation of ANC policies, that you then also have two deputy secretaries, the one that looks at, at monitoring and evaluation, the one that looks at 
communications and the other one that looks at organizational work and therefore that you enlarge your officials. The second option that's put forward is that we should only enlarge, that we should only have a second deputy secretary general uh, with a task of one focusing on organizational work and the other one focusing on monitoring and ev evaluation and ensuring that we monitor the implementation of, of our policies. Um, so those uh, proposals are going to, to, to the structures and this is particularly looking at strengthening the ANC and the National Executive Committee in the areas that we've identified as a problem. The, the conference also, policy conference also said in commissions that we need to look at a mechanism to decisively deal with factional politics in the elections of our leadership and slates. And um, uh, uh, there are a number of proposals that are going to branches. The first one is the fact that we have to have elections in the format that does not allow for, does not make it easy for a single faction in the ANC to then get all of the top six position or all of the 60 position or whatever amount of positions in the NEC. So instead of what we've done, the practice of what we've done in previous conferences where you have a ballot where all six top officials are being voted for, which means that branches, delegates go in there and say that this is our provincial position or this is our factional position and therefore we vote for all six and you have an outcome that represents a certain section and a slate within the ANC that we should have an election, one position after the other, so we start at the position of president um, and whoever becomes second has the opportunity to be nominated for deputy president or be nominated for the position of secretary general and we go on like that um, so that you do break the stranglehold of slates and the, the, the phenomena of slates within, within the organization and there's general support that we need to ensure that at this conference we take decisive action to ensure that we, that we move away from slates. The second one has got to do with nominations by branches. That at the moment, the, 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 the way that it works is that branches can nominate up to 60 people, which means that even if a branch don't know all of the 60, somebody can come to them and say that here's a list of 60 people, and this is who you should nominate. And what we are suggesting is that branches should, we should say that branches must be able to, to nominate 20 people, which means that you have a fair spread of nominations and nominees from across the country. We also think that that kind of system, both with regards to the top six as well as the, the nominations of branches, will also help to bring in other sectors of society. Because the problem with slate politics is that it limits and narrows the base from which the ANC elects its leadership. Because in order to be elected onto the NEC of the, of the ANC, you have to become part of a particular slate. And if you're not, you then don't get elected. So we want to broaden uh, the scope of elections in the ANC and also de make sure that we democratize the process of elections within, within the ANC and do away with factionalism and slates. In the more, and this is a matter for, for the discussion on, on, on constitutional amendments at the, at the national conference, there was a proposal around a much more longer term reform of the ANC's of elections within the ANC and of course it may not be possible for um, the national conference in December but the proposal that is going to branches as a constitutional amendment is that we should look at a form of direct elections for NEC, PC, REC within the ANC. So it means that every member in good standing will have a direct vote to vote for a member of the NEC or the Regional Executive Committee of the, or the Provincial Executive Committee. Um, instead of what we have at the moment is an electoral college of branch delegates. Uh, so that if the ANC have 700,000 or a million members or whatever amount of members we have, all of them in good standing will have a say in uh, uh, who becomes leadership within the, NEC, within the NEC, the PEC, as well as the the Regional Executive Committee and that is something that's going to branches and of course um, it's quite a dra radical department, departure from the system that we have at the moment of an electoral college of delegates uh, uh, of branches um, and therefore the matter will have to be debated again within, within the structures of the, of, of the ANC. Let me conclude by saying that the, that the combination of the discussion on the strategy and tactics, what do we need to do? 
in terms of building the type of society that will address uh, the legacy of apartheid colonialism that will address the legacy of patriarchy as well as this, the mechanisms that we're looking at putting in place with regards to organizational renewal, addressing the integrity of the ANC, reforming and addressing the design issues within the ANC so that it can become much more effective is part of the major work of this conference of ensuring that we do restore the integrity of the ANC and that we restore, restore the confidence um, of the people in the ANC um, and in our, in our movement. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Comrade Phoebe. Uh, by way of process, what will happen is that the, the recommendations as they come from commissions will be packaged in a form of a report which will shall be sent to all branches throughout the country as part of preparation for the 54th National Conference for further discussion in which conference, therefore, it will adopt or reject, may amend some of the recommendations that come from this conference. I must indicate, though, that uh, I've, I've, been, I've, I've been informed that the next, the next commission is almost ready. So we'll take as few questions as possible so that we allow the flow of commissions as they finish their work. May we take three or two, four questions, please? Ranjani, uh, no, 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 you, you're asking the next commission. Sangelo, Pete. Uh, you must talk to Kwete Mandashi. He's not happy about your article. You wrote about him. <laughs> Ranjani first. Go, please. Where's the mic? Can someone, can someone pass? Okay. Hi, it's Ranjani from Times Media. Uh, firstly, on um, the issue of monopoly capital, can you give us, in terms of uh, the proposed resolution, the, the, the context is that monopoly capital or white monopoly capital is supposed to be an impediment towards to radical economic transformation. What is the phrasing now of the, the enemy of uh, radical economic transformation? And um, to uh, Ms. Potkita Kubule, uh, on organizational renewal, you said that um, the proposal is that the NC needs to distance itself from corruption, even from within its ranks. Is there, what was the discussion in terms of how that should be done? Thank you. Pete? Thanks, Izzy. Um, Mr. Nechitenze, both you and Ms. Potkhete Kubule uh, refer to the ANC that needs to restore its integrity, which by inference means that it has lost integrity. Uh, one of the big issues in the country for the last 12 months has been state capture, and the ANC's own research shows that it, that has undermined the party's um, integrity. Is it not too late now? And if it's not too late, what are the concrete steps that you refer to that the ANC will take? to restore that in integrity around that issue. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Samgelo? Um, Samgelo Masego from Jakarta FM. I'd like to just ask a simple question. Where does this idea of monop white monopoly capital actually stem from? Because in what we have read, it also comes from Bell Pottinger. Did you discuss where this concept of white monopoly capital actually began from, or was it a Gupta-sponsored view of a particular faction. Thank you. Pass it to put Eric. Is that put Eric at the back? Uh, I just want to know um, how, oh, this is Eric Naki from The Citizen. I just want to know how is it possible for the branches to be able to elect directly? Because if you consider the fact that branches are the people at grassroots level, and then there's the NEC, there's PEC, is it possible that they will be able to come to the national conference to elect members. How are you going to do it where you say members in good standing will have to elect directly? Maybe it can happen at branch level, but how is it possible at national, even at provincial level? Thanks, Putin. Eric. Um, Comrade Joan? Okay, I will take the questions and Phoebe will assist because both of us were dealing with both of the elements. Um, starting off with monopoly capital, there is the first level of a theoretical conceptualization about a certain level of the development of capitalism that some would characterize as monopoly capitalism. 
you might even have in society where you do not have monopoly capitalism, you might still have monopolies that dominate part particular sectors. And then monopoly capital would be a manifestation of that. What is the attitude of the ANC or the liberation movement towards monopoly capital? As I was saying, this conference has reaffirmed what was agreed at the 2007 Bulukwane conference in the strategy and tactics document. This is that our relationship to monopoly capital is one of cooperation where there are common interests and contestation where there might be divergences. As I was saying, we want them to create jobs. We want them to invest. We want them to bring technology into the country. We want them to participate in black economic empowerment. And to that extent, there will be cooperation. But there are challenges to do with conduct, in terms of pricing, in terms of collusion. There are challenges also to do with the pace at which some of them are transforming. There are challenges that would apply to, to matters to do with the, how, how some of them respond to government policy and how those government policies may relate to their interests. And so then, 2007, and now, 2017, in the formal documents, there is no reference to monopoly capital as an enemy of the ANC or an enemy of the National Democratic Revolution. It's a relationship of cooperation and contestation. Related to this, it's an issue that was raised in the commission. If they were an enemy, what do you do to an enemy? You destroy an enemy. And so our approach to monopoly capital is that to the extent that there might be areas of divergence, you need to regulate and you need to use the word that came from the commission, you need to discipline them in instances where that is necessary. Now there's been this uh, urban legend about where the concept itself originates from. And personally, I wouldn't claim to have done any research on this. Some of the comrades in the commissions were raising this matter, but the approach that bases itself on very recent developments about Bell Potinja and the Guptas might not be entirely accurate. It might as well be that they are using the concept for their own nefarious purposes, because some of the comrades were saying I haven't been able to ascertain this, that the 1962 program of the South African Communist Party, the road to South African freedom, actually uses the notion of white monopoly capital. And perhaps to further indicate that that is the same Congress of the South African Communist Party that for the first time used the concept of colonialism of a special type. And it might as well be that at the same time as the ANC was adopting the concept of colonialism of a special type in the strategy and tactics document in Morogoro in 1969, it might have used even the notion of white monopoly capital. If it has been extracted by someone for their own selfish interest, that's a different issue altogether. Our discussion was conceptual and not about what uh, strange people might be seeking to do. I should further add that uh, with regard to whether it's too late or not, it's never too late to correct wrong things. Uh, it's never too late to ensure that the mass of the cadres of the ANC who want to see this just and equitable society created 
would have that opportunity to ensure that that turnaround happens. There's, it's never too late to do that. It's never too late to ensure that this movement, that is the glue, in my view, that holds South African society together, corrects itself in order to ensure that that social cohesion in South African society is enhanced. It's never too late to do that. It might as well be that uh, like a snowball, some of the things that were being discussed in the commissions are coming at such a rapid pace that many of us are even unable to keep pace with, with all of them. If anything, the emergence of all those things, including the, 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 the leaked emails, they emphasized the agency for the turnaround to happen, as well as all these proposals that we we're talking about. I need also to emphasize that uh, in the discussion of strategy and tactics, there was some focus on the issue of firming up the moral or ethical fiber of the state that all the changes that we're seeing need to happen will not happen if the state, in terms of ministries and departments and state-owned enterprises, are not effective, accountable, and ethical. And perhaps to quote from the report itself, in case you might be interested, it was also said, any form of state capture by any segment of society should be condemned and combated. Yeah, I think I've responded to some of the questions. Let me respond to, to Mr. Kamala. Uh, Mr. Um, I agree with Comrade Joel that the, the analysis of, of the policy conference, and remember this process has been preceded by regional uh, general councils as well as provincial general councils, that there is a groundswell that the major task that this policy conference as well as the national conference need to deal is to restore the integrity of the, of the ANC. Um, the, Suggestions, therefore, around addressing corruption is fairly far-reaching, um, and let me just read some of them. Of course, one of them is that you need to look at the ecosystem, which includes the question about strengthening understanding of the ANC values, ethics and morality, um, and the role that, that the veterans um, of the ANC and all of us as ANC members have to play in that regard but also that the demands that the people, the constitution and the rule of law, law of the country place on us as the guardians of the state and its resources and that we need to stress that, that we need to advocate it in all forums of the ANC so that we are able to then make sure that everybody understands that this is the, the kind of values of the movement that we're talking about. The second recommendation on, on dealing with corruption is to demand that every cadre and member accused of or reported to be involved in corrupt practice that they account to the integrity committee or face disciplinary processes. Um, and so, so our suggestion that the powers of the ANC integrity committee be strengthened at the national conference through the constitution is therefore an attempt to be able to say that this should happen and it should have the power to decisively deal if there's, there's such accusations and people don't come forward and, and account for, for themselves about um, these accusations. It also talks about that we should summarily suspend people who fail to give an acceptable explanation or voluntary step down while they face disciplinary, investigative or prosecu prosecutions and that the ANC should publicly dissociate for itself from anyone, whether business, donor, supporter, or member accused of corruption or reported to be involved in corruption, etc., etc. So there's a list of about eight or nine proposals that's going to branches, very specific on corruptions, to look at how do we, uh, so that national conference can take a holistic decision on it, and we can then look at how do we implement uh, uh, these issues. The second question is about, um, about the, the, the branches, how they will elect directly. There are other parties across the world who have, and they, I think they call them primaries, 
which means that, that you don't have an electoral college where you have delegates representing membership, but what you have is a system where people vote as individual members of the ANC for their NEC or their provincial executive or their regional executive committee. And that is possible with technology. We already do that as, as a country with how many million voters, um, a couple of million voters. Uh, the ANC have about a million members at any given point in time. With technology, it's doable to get ANC members in good standing to, to be able to express themselves um, instead of giving that vote to a branch delegate um, and the kind of manipulated relations and, and difficulties that we've seen at, at the time. So we think it's doable. Um, the technology exists to be able to do that. Uh, to verify whether a member is one in good standing, and secondly, for, for, to allow for them to, to vote directly for uh, um, whether it's the PC member or the provincial executive committee, the NEC, um, or up to uh, the regional executive committee. So we think it's doable, uh, but as I say, the, uh, it's a radical department from how we've done departure from how we've done it before, um, and therefore the. Um, the, the, uh, the structures will have to discuss that, but I think that there is a groundswell of, of, of support that we need to look at a different system that gives all members the opportunity uh, to participate. Let me conclude on this question about whether it's not too late. The ANC is 105 years old, and I think that we've gone through ebbs and flows. Um, there were points when even the leadership of the ANC in the 1930s thought that this is the end of the, the organization. Um, and one of the strengths of the movement has been its capacity to self-correct. Um, and I think that, that across the commission, there is general unity and a sense to say that we need to self-correct, that we need to reverse the decline, and that this is the moment to do that. And if we don't do it, use this opportunity in this moment, then it may, not, it may be uh, uh, too late. So, so we certainly don't think it's too late. The members of the ANC don't think it's too late. The leadership doesn't think it's too late. So we're quite confident that the measures that we're proposing will, will lead to the restoration of the integrity of the ANC. Um, and that is why between now and national conference, we will certainly make sure that there's rigorous discussions about these values, about these measures, so that national conference can take de decisive decisions. Can we give you a few minutes before the top of the hour for you to file to cross over? The next commission is coming. Thank you very much. Commission reporting back to the media on today's deliberations and uh, uh, touching on organizational renewal uh, and also other aspects. We, we have our guests.